at the beginning of our conversation today, let's start with the fundamental differences between the diesel and auto cycles. Okay, and to do that first, let's think about what we learned in the last lecture about the auto cycle and in the video that we watched. So in the auto cycle, you know, air and fuel mixture is added to the cylinder, right? And they're added together, right? And then that cylinder is compressed. And then the spark plug ignites the mixture. And because you add the air and the fuel together, and it's already all there at the beginning of the cycle, we can assume that that combustion is almost instantaneous. And so that heat added step or the combustion step is isochoric, right? It happens at constant volume. And then after that instantaneous addition of heat, then the cylinder expands. But as we also saw in the video for the diesel cycle, that at the beginning of the cycle, there's actually only air in the cylinder, right? And then what's happen what happens is that the next step is to compress the air all by itself to very high temperature and pressure. And the compression ratio in a diesel engine is much, much higher in the auto engine. So if we wanted to actually talk about the compression ratio, So for a diesel engine, you know, it can be like 15 to 20. And for an in, a typical internal combustion engine, like in a car, which undergoes the auto cycle, we're talking compression ratios about eight to 10. And if both of those are considered to be very similar, right? They're both reversible adiabatic compressions. What that means is if we compress more, actually the temperature and pressure in the uh, in the diesel cycle are much much higher right and so you know this is way higher than the auto cycle and because of that you don't actually need to have a spark plug so the next step is that after you've compressed the air to really high ratios right to really high temperature and pressure the air is so hot that we're going to add the fuel right which is the diesel fuel at full compression. And what this does is it auto ignites the fuel. And there's a time element that happens here that it's not that you can do an instantaneous injection of the fuel. In fact, as soon as you start to inject the fuel in a diesel cycle, it starts to burn and it actually burns as the piston is moving and it burns somewhat slowly, um, even through the part where the cylinder starts to move away from its highest compression ratio. And because of this, right, that the combustion is happening continuously as the piston moves, the best approximation for its behavior is not that the combustion or the heat addition step happens at constant volume where we had a spark plug that could instantaneously ignite it because all the fuel was already there. In the diesel cycle, since we're, since we're adding the fuel as the combustion occurs, it can be assumed that the combustion occurs at constant pressure instead of constant volume. And this is really the key difference between the diesel cycle 
and the auto cycle. And what this means for the diesel cycle is that the four steps that we will talk about is that step one is a reversible adiabatic compression. And of course, we know that reversible and adiabatic is just um, code for isentropic. And now step two in this process, instead of being isochoric, in here is isobaric. So it's an isobaric expansion, because remember, as we are combusting the fuel, the piston is still moving, okay? And then step three is a reversible adiabatic expansion. Of course, that also means that it's isentropic. And then step four is very similar to the auto cycle, where remember, now we just need to dump the products into the exhaust manifold and then take in more air. And so that is at constant volume, right? So that just like um, the auto cycle is an isochoric exhaust and intake, which really is just an isochoric removal of heat. And if we wanna think about this just quickly, that you know, this is like we are doing a little bit of work to compress the gas, right? This is where we add heat. This is where we get work from the cycle. And then this is where we dump the hot combustion products out into um, the surroundings. And so if we looked at this in a very similar way to how we looked at the auto cycle and the Carno cycle, where we were to draw PV diagram and a TS diagram for the process. And we started with our reversible adiabatic compression. So remember this, just like the auto cycle was at the lowest pressure and temperature and therefore the highest specific volume. And now we're gonna have a step that's very, very similar to what we had in the auto cycle where we have um, our compression ratio. So that's step one, right? This reversible adiabatic compression. And now we have an isobaric expansion as we add heat, right? So here's step two happens at constant pressure. We know that step four is going to be isochoric. So I'm going to do this ahead of time and draw this straight. And so now we have step three is our expansion and step four is exhaust and intake. And that's how we'd move around the diesel cycle. And remember the PV diagram for the auto cycle was much different, right? That we actually had a um, reversible adiabatic uh, compression. Then we had an isochoric addition of heat, then we had the expansion, and then we had exhaust and intake, right? So those diagrams looked fundamentally different. And so I'll go around the same way that I did um, when we talked about the auto cycle, right? And we'll label some points. So I'm gonna call that point A, B, C, and D. Also to keep track, we said a moment ago, right, this, is where we know that we add heat, right? This we know is where we remove it. This is the compression step. And this is the exhaust, right? And that's really what we're interested in. And we will we'll get there and define efficiency in just a moment. So now the TS diagram being at the lowest temperature and pressure we will be at the lowest entropy, right? And the lowest point in this diagram. So we'll be far to the left and far down. And so we'll start our TS diagram here. And that is point C, right? 
And that first step is isentropic, right? It's a reversible adiabatic compression. So the temperature is gonna go up, right? So that's step one. Then the second step is our isobaric expansion, right? So the pressure is constant, but the temperature is gonna go up. And so the entropy is gonna go up. And so then we have, we go here. Then the third step is our reversible adiabatic expansion. So we know the temperature is gonna come down. So we end up there as part of step three. And then finally, we have our isochoric removal of heat. So the temperature is gonna come down, we're gonna go back to the initial condition, right? So there we are on the TS diagram and there's step four. And just to maintain our notation, right? That's D, that's A, and that's B, okay? So is this relatively clear to everybody? Are you guys comfortable with the two diagrams that we've drawn? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I need to process it for a little bit, but. Yeah, and I think the um, the practice on the homework and the problem that we're gonna do in a minute, I think, I think will help. Now, just like we did with the Carnot cycle and then with the Otto cycle, we're gonna define the efficiency of the process and then we're gonna derive an expression that's a function of the temperatures in the process that we can do a straightforward calculation of this air standard diesel cycle. And there's no reason to really change how we've defined efficiency in the last couple of lectures. It still holds, I think, very comfortably that the efficiency of this heat engine is just minus the net amount of work that's done divided by the heat that we add to the process, right? And for us, that means that the net amount of work in this case is also the sum of the Qs, right? Just like we've done before. And Q in is Q2. And if we think about the heating steps here, well, the heating steps are just step two up here and step four there. And so this just becomes very similar to what we've done with previous cycles. This is just Q2 plus Q4 divided by Q2, or that equals one plus Q4 over Q2, okay? And now we're left with a task of trying to figure out what is Q4 and what is Q2? Well, if we look at step four, so this is isochoric and we have a pseudo closed system. And so if it's isochoric, there's no change in the volume. And if there's no change in the volume, that means that no work is done. So the numerator here is just, when we get rid of the work term, it's just delta U is equal to Q. And delta U for step four, we know is gonna be related to CV. We'll get there in just a second. So that's delta U. Now in step two, this is not done at constant volume. However, we derived much earlier on in the semester that when you have a constant pressure process, that Q was equal to delta H. And we're gonna use that derivation that that is delta H for step two. And if that's the case, our equation for the efficiency just becomes equal to one plus the integral from TB to TC, right? Because this is step four of CVDT divided by the integral from TD to TA of CPDT. And we can make the further assumption that the heat capacities are approximately constant. And if those two heat capacities are constant, then we come up with this expression that this is just equal to one plus CV times TC minus TB divided by CP times TA 
minus TD. And this looks a little dissimilar to how we have defined efficiency before because of this plus sign. We also know from our diagram that TB is always going to be greater than TC. And if that's the case, not to carry this artificial negative with a plus sign that looks uncomfortable to us in the context of everything else that we've done, often what's done is that TB and TC are flipped and then we put a minus sign. So then the efficiency becomes equal to one minus CV over CP times TB minus TC divided by TA minus T sub D, okay? And there is our expression for the efficiency of the auto cycle, okay? Or not the auto cycle, the diesel cycle, sorry. Would it not be TD minus TA? Well, so we only flipped the numerator, not the denominator, because if we had flipped both of them, um, this would still be plus. Okay. Right? Yeah, that would be like multiplying both the top and the bottom by minus one. So that would, that would have just canceled. But yeah, good question. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things about the, the diesel cycle is that now there are multiple ratios that we need to know. So in the auto cycle, we typically only need to know the compression ratio. But in the auto cycle, we do need to know the compression ratio. And here, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. So typically, if we are given, just like we were in the auto cycle problem we solved, the initial state, and um, we wanted to calculate all of the information about the cycle to find all of these temperatures, right? We would need to know, of course, the compression ratio. which in this case is just um, V sub D over V sub C. But now we also need to know that and either the expansion ratio which is V sub B over VA or the cutoff ratio. And that is actually defined as VA over V sub D. And the reason we need to know one of those is it basically tells us where in the piston we stop burning fuel or we stop adding heat, right? So that'll define where this point is. And that point at constant pressure with given, um, will give you a specific volume. And that tells you how much heat that you added to the cycle, okay? And so you just need to know where you are along this axis, okay? And a really good practice about knowing these two ratios is actually um, from uh, Smith Van S, the eighth edition that we've been using problem 8.13. Now that you guys are going to practice as a homework problem because it's a relatively straightforward um, application of the efficiency equation that we've derived and working your way around the cycle, just like we did with the auto cycle, where you'll calculate the pressure, the volume, and the temperature at points a, B, C, and D. So um, the math will be very similar to something that you've done before. And so I didn't think with the limited time that we have together to practice that we'll do that. We'll, I'll allow you guys the opportunity to do that practice on your own. And of course we meet in office hours and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have um, in, in office hours. So what I thought might be a little bit um, more interesting for us to do is to work on another problem from the book that has an interesting hiccup because you're used to seeing 
us given an initial condition and some information about the compression ratios. But that doesn't always need to be the case. All you need to know is a certain amount of information where instead of knowing the initial state plus two ratios, you could be given three other pieces of information and still have enough information to determine the efficiency of the cycle. And this is done pretty well in problem 5.19 in the book, where instead of giving you, like I said, two ratios and an initial condition, or maybe one ratio, the heat that was added and the initial state, instead they give the temperature of three of the four steps in the cycle and ask us to calculate the efficiency. And so we know we still have three pieces of information, so we should be able to solve the problem. And today I'll prove to you that we can do that. And the math has one interesting um, part to it, but it uses all the concepts that we've already used through the course of, of this semester. And so we know in this process that TC is equal to 200 degrees, TD is equal to 1000 degrees, and TA is equal to 1700 degrees. Okay, so let's tackle this and, um, and see what we can do with it. All right, now, I think that the most logical place for us to start a problem like this is where we already can use assumptions from information that we have. And the two steps that immediately stuck out to me when I read this problem were steps one and steps three because we know that they are isentropic, right? They are both reversible adiabatic steps. So if that's the case, we can use equations that we already have developed and have used extensively throughout the course of, of this semester. So if we do this, right, then we know in step one that delta S over R is equal to zero. But we know then that that is equal to the integral from TC to TD, right? And I'll be very clear that this is in step one of CV over R DT over T plus the natural log of V sub D over V sub C. And the reason that I picked the volume specific form here is because we also have this really interesting thing that's gonna happen in step four, where the volume's gonna be constant. And you'll see when we move a little bit further in this problem, we're gonna use that to our advantage, okay? So I already think, what do I know about the process? I know delta S is equal to zero in two stages, and I know the volume is constant in another stage. So I'm gonna find a way to then link the fact that delta S is equal to zero with a constant volume and the fact that those are both linked to the temperature. And hopefully that makes sense and hopefully it makes sense as we move through the problem. So in the standard diesel cycle, it's often assumed that air is a simple ideal gas. And if that's the case, then our expression here just becomes that zero is equal to five halves R over R, which so that becomes the integral from TC to TD of five halves DT over T plus the natural log of V sub D over V sub C. And I'll do two things at the same time because we've, we've done this before. So then this is um, minus the natural log of V sub D over VC equals five halves times the natural log of TD over TC, right? Hopefully that feels okay. And then I'll, you guys also know I don't like minus signs in front of logs. 
So then that's just equal to the natural log of VC over VD, okay? And if that's the case, we actually can simplify this relatively simply, right? Where we move five halves into the log using one of the rules for logs, and then we take the exponent of both sides. And from there, we get an expression that TD over TC to the five halves equals VC over V sub D, okay? And I'm gonna box this and just put a star next to it because we're gonna use this in just a second, okay? All right, so hopefully you guys are comfortable with that math. And we can apply the exact same thing to step three, okay? And it would be the exact same math to get there. And what we'll find is that TB over TA to the five halves, right? Because this was also an isentropic step is just equal to VA over VB. And I'll do the same thing, right? I'll box this and I'm gonna star this, okay? All right, is this okay with everybody? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so then I'm gonna do something that might not make immediate sense, but I know I need to be able to relate these volumes. And I actually know that this volume and this volume are equal to each other, right? So if you think about this, I have all four temperatures here. I know three of them. I also have two values here that I know are equal to each other, right? Because step four is isochoric. And the most logical way I could think to try to relate the temperatures to that isochoric step is I'm gonna multiply these two expressions by one, of no, by one another. And when I do that, I'll get an expression that is TD over TC to the five halves times TB over TA to the five halves equals V sub C over V sub D times V sub A over V sub B. And for you guys, this might be the most uncomfortable thing that we do. Now on the right-hand side of this equation, I want to get rid of these two things because I know that they're equal to each other. So actually just the right side of this equation, I can write as VC over VB times VA over V sub D. And if VC over VB is equal to one, that goes away. And now we have simply VA over V sub D. Now, how is this gonna help us, right? We don't actually know what VA and V sub D are. Well, we can actually use the fact that we can relate VA and V sub D, if you let me just scroll up for a second, through step two. So in step two, that is done at constant pressure. And because of that, right? So we're gonna use, oh, sorry guys, I zoomed out a little bit. The fact that step two is at constant pressure. And so we can use the ideal gas law to relate those two states. So if we do that, we have PA VA over PD, PD times V sub D is equal to R times TA over R times TD. And since the pressures are the same, those go away and the ideal gas constant of course never changes. And so now from step two, we actually have a relationship. 
that VA over V sub D is just equal to TA over T sub D. And we can use that and put that in this equation. And if we do that, we know that TD over TC to the five halves times TB over TA to the five halves is equal to TA over TD. And this is really good news because we know all the temperatures except for TB, right? We know everything else that is in this equation. And TB is the last piece of information that we need to find the efficiency. And so I'm just gonna work for a second on rearranging this equation in a way that we can easily get an expression that says TB is equal to stuff that we have already measured, okay? Now, the thing to me that makes the most sense is that A and D are linked here, but they're separated here. Fortunately though, TA and TD are raised to the same power, right? They're both raised to the five halves. If that's the case, we actually can do a very simple switch that we can just switch these two inside of the parentheses because their powers are the same. And so if we do that, we get TB over TC to the five halves times TD over TA to the five halves equals TA over TD. Or if I wanna make it you know, a little bit cleaner for what we're gonna do in the next step, that's just TD over TA to the minus one, okay? And so now I can divide both sides of this equation by TD over TA to the five halves. So TB over TC to the five halves equals TD over TA to the minus one over TD over TA to the five halves. And of course, that just equals TD over TA to the minus one minus five halves, which is just minus seven halves. And if I take both sides of this equation to the two fifths, you get TB over TC equals TD over TA times, or sorry, raised to the minus seven fifths power. And finally, that means that TB equals TC times TD over TA to the minus seven fifths. And hopefully this shows that we can find the efficiency given almost any three pieces of information. And if we solve this, right, so TB equals 473.15 Kelvin times 1,273.15 Kelvin over 1,973.15 Kelvin raised to the minus seven fifths. And so that means that our temperature at B is equal to 873.8 Kelvin, okay? All right, so we figured out this last piece of information we need to determine the efficiency. All right, I'll let you guys catch up with the writing. So now that means that we have one more thing that we need to do, right? Calculate efficiency, but also ask ourselves how the assumptions in this problem have impacted this expression for the efficiency, okay? So if I just paste that here. Quick question, is it seven, negative seven fifths or seven halves? Seven fifths, because what you end up doing here is that you have minus seven halves. And then when you take it to the two fifths, it's like times two over five, right? And so then those twos go away. Got it, thank you. Yep, no problem. Okay, so here's our expression. And remember, 
we assumed above that air was a simple ideal gas. So remember that for a simple ideal gas, that CV over CP would then be equal to five halves R divided by seven halves R, right? So the R's cancel and the two's cancel. And so that just equals five over seven. So for a, so for a simple, well, air in a diesel cycle as a simple ideal gas, the efficiency is equal to one minus five sevenths times then TB minus TC over TA minus TD. So let's insert our expressions from this problem. So this is 873.8 minus 473.15 Kelvin divided by 1973.15 Kelvin minus 1273.15 Kelvin. And that efficiency then for this process is equal to 0 0.59.